So, uh, if you're ready, uh, we can start with this uh, with this journey. I don't know. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. Okay. First of all, hello, my friend. Welcome back in another interview. Finally. After a long time, I've got Jimmy with me from USA. Jimmy in a, is a natural photographer located in, U, in Utah, okay? Uh, but please, Jimmy, uh, would you mind to introduce yourself just to know you a little better? Yeah, so again, my name is Jimmy Breitenstein. I'm currently located in Utah in the United States. I'm a wildlife photographer focused primarily on what I call backcountry wildlife. So not so much the roadside wildlife photography but wildlife that you have to hike a little bit more to get to or venture out a little bit further to get to uh, that's what i like to focus on the most uh, i'm self-taught so i've never taken any wildlife photography courses or oh, anything okay. like that it's all just <laughs> like many of us no? what was that like many of us <laughs> yep like most of us yep exactly yeah. so uh, and i absolutely love it it's my full-time job and i absolutely love it oh great i would like to uh, have a job like that but unfortunately <laughs> now i'm a computer programmer so okay i can live with this job but i would like to change it uh, as a natural photographer but in italy it's quite uh, difficult to uh, to follow a, a job like that because they don't pay quite enough nope. <laughs> unless you are uh, maybe really famous but I'm not famous <laughs> well, neither am I but it's a uh, it's a lot of fun it's a lot of hard work and mm -hmm. it's taken me a long time to get to this point it's taken a lot of years of working other jobs and doing photography during that time to get to this point uh, it's it's been great Oh yeah, but, um, uh, do you make a wor uh, workshop uh, with your job so you bring uh, um, other photographers in your location? I feel yep. so. That's one of my main sources right now of income oh, okay. with photography is doing workshops. I do uh, group workshops as well mm -hmm. as private one-on-one -on -one workshops okay. depending on the species that people want to photograph. I'll go out and find the wildlife and bring the people out and photograph them. Okay. Not using YouTube monetization. <laughs> yeah. I've got a little bit of YouTube stuff here and there, but it's, it's not much. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, uh, Jimmy, one of the most interesting aspects of your way to, to live nature uh, are the sandals. Okay. <laughs> I'll be worried to, injure your, myself but you uh, you look so, super comfortable with them uh, so I was curious to understand why there is a reason uh, you make uh, you to feel more free in nature using the sandals or is a choice uh, I don't know it's an aspect uh, really <laughs> strange but it's it's interesting you know I get a lot of people asking about the sandals, so oh. there's a lot of different reasons why I wear sandals most of the time. Uh, I only do so, obviously, if I feel safe wearing them. If I'm in a really, like, mountainous, rocky terrain with rocks rolling everywhere, I don't do sandals. Or if it's in the middle of winter, you know, something like that, I don't do sandals. But the main reason why I wear sandals now is because of the type of photography that I do where it's really remote sometimes. Uh, I'll hike for miles and miles for even oh, okay. days sometimes before I find wildlife to photograph and a lot of the terrain that I photograph wildlife in there's a lot of streams and rivers and creeks that I have to cross oh, okay. and it was just a pain with shoes. Every time I would get to a stream, I would have to take my shoes and my socks off, cross, dry my feet okay. off, put them back on, and then 10 minutes later do the same thing. So I started wearing sandals where I can just go right through the water. Um, if I'm photographing okay. animals near water, I don't have to worry about taking my shoes off. I can just go right in with them. So it, it's it just, very comfortable to me now yeah. and um, it's clear now it's clear uh, really now i understand you the reason uh 
Okay, I think, uh, yeah, no, I was thinking to use myself, but I, I think I, I wouldn't feel so comfortable. It's a good response, it's a, and I think it's a useful stuff for you, I understand mm -hmm. you. Okay, so it's really, really fine. Okay, I think it's time, uh, if you're ready for questions, uh, we are, we are ready. Okay, yep. okay. The, the first uh, mm, question are about you. So, uh, when did you start taking pictures in nature? So, I started taking pictures when I was just a kid. Um, oh. I got my first film camera when I was about, it was seven, uh, around there, and uh, I just, you know, it was a little point and shoot film camera and I just started photographing deer and raccoons and different things at my grandma's house in California. But I didn't really start getting into wildlife photography until about 2016 was the year. So about seven years ago. And uh, that's when I really started trying to learn more about photography and uh compositions and you know just all the different things yeah. uh the different settings with the cameras and that's also when i started choosing species um you know wildlife species that i wanted to photograph and setting more goals and whatnot you know i i've always had goals as a kid there were always animals that i wanted to photograph yeah. but it wasn't until around 2016 when okay. i really started working towards those So basically, you are a young photographer, <laughs> yeah, like me, because I started to um, to photograph in 2013. Oh wow! Yes, yeah. So uh, only 10 years ago. Okay. So more or less, uh, we are pretty similar uh, about uh, time. Um, okay, nice, nice. Mm, I thought you you were a little older uh, as a photographer because your um, uh, your approach to wildlife is is really uh, i don't know if i can say you in english i don't know mature uh, like not uh, ripe but like fruit mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so but you have a strong knowledge uh, approaching wildlife and i think um uh To, uh, when you reach uh, that kind of knowledge, it means that you had a lot of experiences uh, in nature, uh, so in your life. Uh, but um, as I said, you are pretty young for a uh, nature photography. But uh, it's for me, it's better because it, uh, it means that you uh, you had studied a lot uh, to reach a level like that. So, so congratulations. I, I, thank you. Um, I, I do feel like I do things a little bit different than other photographers my age. You know, y you say it's more of like a mature type of photography, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I, I would probably call it more of like a, you know, a term that we use here is old school, you know, just like an old fashioned uh, okay, okay. kind of yeah, okay. photography. I think a lot of that comes from the way that I learned about wildlife growing up, I've always been obsessed with animals. And so I would watch a lot of nature shows on TV, like the old PBS nature and things like that. And on those shows, I would see these wildlife photographers sitting in a blind for, you know, mm -hmm. six months to get a picture yeah. of a snow leopard yeah. or, you know, <laughs> something like that. So that's more so my approach to wildlife photography is kind of that old school mentality mm. of you know photographing these animals without bothering them at all without them even uh, knowing I'm there a okay, lot but, of time uh, about approach uh, there are the questions we after so please don't spoil it <laughs> right now <laughs> okay okay it's super interesting yes uh, okay um how important is uh, for you to plan your photo shoot, uh, your adventure in nature. So at least, do you plan uh, your adventure, your photo shoot? I try to as much as possible. I mean, mm -hmm. when dealing with wildlife, you can only plan to a certain level, yeah. 
but uh, yeah, I, I do plan as much as possible. I mean, I was out this morning before, you know, meeting with you and I had a very specific plan of, okay, here's exactly what I'm going to do this morning to try to find what I'm looking for. And I wasn't able to, and that's how yeah. it goes a lot yeah. of times. But especially if I have a longer trip, um, you know, like five days or two weeks, you know, somewhere in that time frame, I really try to plan exactly where I'm going and try to plan, you know, just a very tight itinerary or ske okay. schedule on my trip. But I do leave that open. Uh, I do leave it as flexible as possible at the same time in case I see a different species that I wasn't expecting and I want to spend some time photographing that species. Uh, okay. But okay. It, being a full-time wildlife photographer, I think people get the false impression that I can just go out and do whatever I want with the animals and I've got unlimited time to spend with wildlife, but I actually feel like I'm on a tighter schedule now than I was when I had a different full-time job because I have to turn the photography into income, meaning every time I go out, I really need to try as hard as possible to find something to photograph yeah. and make meaningful photographs that I could turn around and sell or, you know, do something with. Oh, um, but do you sell your prints? Oh, I do, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, very good, okay. Okay, it's clear your point of view, of course, you have to, to live with, uh, with your job, so uh, you need to get back home with some results, uh, it's clear, okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite subject and why? My absolute favorite animals to photograph are foxes. Uh, oh. Just any species of fox, but specifically, they're known as desert kit foxes. Mm -hmm. um, they're not a very well-known species. They're, they live here in the North America, and uh, they, they're just very charismatic animals. They've got these giant ears, yeah. and they're just really small. They're about the size of a house cat, um, but they're... They live in these very arid desert regions, and they're just really fun to photograph. But it, really, any species of fox, I just love photographing because they're so... They're playful, they're charismatic, they're energetic. They are very caring and like family-oriented animals where both adults play these huge roles in raising the young. And uh, they're just... Yeah, very loyal animals to each other within a family unit. And I just love that in a species. And they're, they're just so much fun to photograph. So yeah, any species yeah, of fox, I would love to photograph. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Uh, I remember your last video of the Arctic fox in, uh, in Alaska. Quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, the fox is a dream for me because uh, I've got uh, the chance to photograph them, only one. Uh, when I was photographing the um, Eurasian um, griffons, yes. Uh, so only by chance, uh, even because uh, over here in Italy, uh, there are a lot of hunters that kill uh, foxes. Uh, I don't know in uh, USA, but in Italy, it's like that, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, trying to, to get a fox, it's super hard. And now I'm trying to monitorize uh, a couple of foxes uh, in our area that I'm studying, but I don't know uh, where is uh, very then because it should be the best uh, option, the best uh, situation uh, finding the, the den, okay? But as I said, it's super hard. They are so skittish that I can't uh, manage to, to find the den. So I'm using the uh, trap camera I don't know if I, I if I'll be able to photograph them in future. But I hope so much. <laughs> you'll get it if you you put enough time into it, and you'll you'll get it. And if you're ever over here visiting in my area, just let me know, and we'll go out oh, and find some foxes. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I would like so much. <laughs> okay, I hope uh, next year to go um, to Canada with my uh, wife for the uh, summer holiday. 
maybe I don't know. It should be nice to to meet each other uh, if you if you can, of course. Maybe a couple of days. Yeah. Why not? That'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if I can, of course, I I tell you. So okay, yeah, let me know. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Mm. Speaking about gear, uh, I think you are using Canon. Uh, okay, Canon stuff. Uh, do you think to have the best gear will improve your photography? I don't. Uh, there's mm. definitely advantages that come with having the best gear or better gear, but I don't believe that you need to have the best gear in order to get the best photos. I think what it really comes down to is how you use the gear you have and just how much time you put into it. Uh, because I've gone out with a lot of photographers, uh, met a lot of photographers that have the best gear mm -hmm available and they're missing so many shots because they're not yeah. practiced with their camera they don't know how to use the gear that they have and you know i'll see other photographers out there with a kit body and lens that they bought for really cheap and they're getting these amazing photos yeah. because they're yeah. utilizing every aspect of the gear that they have they're putting the time in out in nature with the wildlife learning the behaviors and everything and um so no i i don't believe you need the best gear yeah. to get the best photos but i do know that it definitely helps and there's gear that i wish that i had in order to capitalize more yeah. on certain scenarios i agree i agree even because even uh, even because having uh, a you know, 600 millimeters f4 lens, a prime lens, if I make bad photos, uh, it will remain uh, bad even with a lens like that. So <laughs> it's not the gear, even though sometimes gear uh, make difference uh, in some situation. Okay, with a prime lens, maybe you you've got a a better background, a better bouquet, okay, stuff like that. But actually, I think the most important thing is uh, how people approach our life, uh, in order to to go closer to to the subject without disturbing them. Of course, because this is my primary uh, goal, not to get in trouble anymore. Because I don't want to scare them. So this is my first. Uh, thing in, in mind when I go outdoor so um, okay uh, staying uh, with uh, gear uh, what's your favorite accessory in wildlife photography if there is one I've got one for me <laughs> that's hard um, when you ask about accessories are you do you mean specifically everything. camera gear or uh, no everything even okay. clothes. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's a hard question. I would have to say, I'm just going to lump all these into one, but photo blinds. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Photography blind or hide would be my favorite accessory if you could call them yeah. that. Uh, but you can do so much with a good photo blind. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Uh, indeed, in my car, I've got two photo blinds or to hide, I don't know, uh, I would, you say in, uh, in USA, uh, maybe photo blind? We say blind, uh, okay. yeah. Yes, I've got two photo blind in my car. Uh, one to stay low, so really small photo blind, and another a pop-up photo blind, so you know, to, to be really quick in the, uh, in the field. And with them, I've got a lot of beautiful pictures, but maybe, not using them, uh, maybe I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get. So mm -hmm. I think it's uh, super useful. And even though uh, there are some cons using uh, a photo blind, so you can't move around you or move uh, in another spot so quickly. So for some situation, it's mandatory using a photo blind. Uh, for example, over here in um, in Italy when you want to photograph um, a raptor, so a bit of prey, 
you need to or, or you build a photo blind in the place or you can use a, a portable like mine that mm -hmm. are super nice to use it so, yeah i agree they they do have their cons like you said uh but i feel like the more that you start to use them and the better you know the subject you're trying to photograph mm -hmm. it's going to become less and less that you set it up in the wrong place or you have to move yeah. it or you know, things yeah. like that the the better you know your subject the better you can guess yes. or almost pinpoint exactly where they're going to be and know exactly where you need to set up your blind uh, indeed uh planning a photo shoot uh means like that also like that uh, knowing better the subject uh, their behavior uh, in order to put the photo blind or, or or yourself in the right place at the right moment of course mm -hmm. so it's an aspect to not uh, underestimate uh, knowing better the the subject okay mm -hmm. um always speaking about uh, gear how is your relationship with gear more hate or more love or maybe you are in the middle so are you addicted to to gear or it's a normal relationship i'd say it's a normal relationship i mean okay. there's i've got such a huge long list of gear that i would like to try out it's just it gets so expensive so fast that uh i there's a lot of gear i'll never try out because it's too expensive um but mm -hmm. I mean, there are essential items like the blinds and uh, because I do a lot of backpacking, there's a lot of essential backpacking gear that I need to have with me to keep me safe out in nature. But as far as photography gear goes, it just gets so expensive so fast. So I really try to capitalize on everything that I have right now. And every once in a while I'll invest in you know, some sort of new gear that I feel will really boost my photography game. And, um, but you know, if, if I don't have multiple reasons of getting that gear, I probably won't get it and I'll probably never try it. I, okay. I, I try to make as much of my own gear as I can, as weird as that sounds. Uh, but you know, like my photo blinds, for example, mm -hmm. I try to make as many of those as I can because you can do it for a lot cheaper than buying one. So I, I feel like I have a normal relationship with mm -hmm. gear. I'm not addicted to buying the greatest new thing. As okay, not, not only uh, um, camera lenses and stuff like that, but also um, because I saw that you use a lot of uh, tent, tent, yes, tent, mm -hmm. uh, camping tent when you are in nature. So maybe you need uh, a good stuff in order to to be more safe, more uh, more sure in nature. So uh, gear is also that okay. for me, yeah. at least. Uh, okay. Like I mentioned, I do have a lot of backpacking gear, yeah, yeah. camping gear that I use. And like you said, it's, it's to keep me safe while I'm out there. I mean, at the end of the day, I've got a ton of camera gear with me. And if it were to snow or rain and I didn't have gear to protect that, camera equipment then it's going to be ruined and it doesn't matter you know how close i'm able to get to the wildlife or whatever if i can't take a picture of it so i, I do have a lot of camping yeah. gear and that type of gear just to keep myself and my camera equipment safe mm -hmm. um just speaking about tents um do you have uh, um one for every kind of season maybe or for a different kind of weather. Maybe it's, uh, it's snowing or it's raining or I don't know, something like that. Yeah, so I use, um, I've, it's a ultralight backpacking tent is what I use the majority of the time. And it, it's just really light. I don't know what the weight would be. I mean, here it's, it's about three pounds. I don't know what that equates to um in kilos but uh, okay maybe it, it's just double. A, yeah approximately um yeah. but uh yeah it's just this really small tent that it's a two-person tent but it packs down really small and i can carry it really easily with me and i use that 
usually like spring through fall. Okay. And then in the winter, this sounds really weird, but I usually use a tarp shelter in the winter. Oh. And it's even smaller. It's just yeah, yeah, this yeah, really yeah. small tarp that I can throw up over my stuff. Okay. And uh, I'll usually use that unless I'm in really windy or harsh mm -hmm. conditions. Then I've got a bulkier tent that I use. And um, when I can, I've also got, it's called a bivy sack. Okay. And it's, uh, it's not a tent. It's just like a sleeve. A yeah, yeah. I understand uh, what you mean. Yeah. Oh, okay. Really nice. And so I use so, that as much as possible. But um, uh, yeah, I do have a different shelter for each set of weather conditions. Okay. Yeah. Season. Okay. You are not addicted to gear, but <laughs> you uh, you have got the right gear for the right moment, for the right situation. Okay. Yep. So it's important uh, to know uh, because. When I watch your video, I, I try to understand um, uh, the moment before uh, you are in the field, uh, the preparation of, 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 you, of all your gear. Uh, um, when you were in, in Alaska photographing beers, uh, you've got a, a lot of uh, equipment so a big uh, tent, uh, backpack of any kind, of course, uh, camera lenses, uh, stuff like that. So a lot of uh, uh, stuff to lug around. And I was uh, imagining uh, the effort to bring uh, to yourself all that kind of stuff. So amazing. <laughs> Yeah, Alaska, it is a little bit different out there because I set up a base camp. So mm -hmm. I'm not, I mean, I bring a lot of gear, but I'm not hiking around with all that gear all okay. day. Um, I, I get to my location, I set up my base camp, and I leave the majority of that gear there. And I just go out with my camera gear okay. during the day. Okay. And then at the end of the day, I come back to my base camp. Okay, just a question about that, um, that video. I saw that you uh, made um, a border uh, um, around the tent uh, for beer, for keeping keep, keeping far far away. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yeah, it's uh, a it, it's called a bear fence. It's an electrified fence, basically. Ah, okay, electrified. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's clear. It's not very and, powerful. Like you can grab onto it and it, it doesn't hurt, but the okay. bears, they can sense the electricity. And oh. usually when a bear is curious and investigating something, it'll touch it with its nose. Oh, okay. And the bear's nose is very sensitive okay. and the bear's not wearing rubber shoes or anything, you know, so it's, it's got a lot of contact with the ground. So okay. when a bear touches that fence with its nose, it gives it a pretty good shock. Whereas okay. if a human were to grab it, it you can mm -hmm. barely feel it sometimes. Okay. But uh, in, uh, in any case, it's safer uh, even for animal, not only for human. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nice, nice. Oh, I'm, I saw that kind of protection uh, even for, um, from another photographer, maybe you know more Tim uh, Ilmer. Mm -hmm. the, uh, yes. Um, and he used uh, the same kind of uh, protection. So I was pretty curious to understand how to work it. So now, now uh, I know how it works. His is a little bit different, I think. Um, if it's the same video that I'm thinking about, was it when he went out to do the polar bears? Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe, but yeah, I, so I don't remember now. Okay. So yeah, there was a video he did where he has a fence around yeah. his camp and his, I don't think it was electric, but mm -hmm. it's got a little, uh, it's like a gunpowder charge blast. It, it makes ah, okay. a really loud noise. If a bear were to walk through that fence, it pulls a pin okay. and it sends out a really loud noise so he can know just that to scare there. the the birds oh, okay mm -hmm. it's a different approach mm -hmm. okay. but yeah very similar concept you're using some sort of perimeter fence to protect yourself mm -hmm. or warn yourself that there's 
a large predator right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a really, really nice one. Good. Um, yes, okay. Uh, now it's time to approach. And the first question is, uh, what's your favorite method to approach wildlife? Even though I think... Uh, <laughs> uh, I love... Well, when you, when you say approach, do you mean actually like approach them physically or to photograph them? Uh, both. Okay. So to photograph them, I love using the blinds like I've talked about. Okay. That's yeah. my favorite approach to photography is using a, a photo blind. Mm -hmm. As far as actually like physically approaching wildlife, I do so as ethically as possible. And I try to learn about the animal's behavior Okay. as much as possible before I ever photograph that animal. That way I know a few things. I know what it's likely to do when I'm photographing it, uh, what like mannerisms it has, different displays of curiosity or okay. aggression or being nervous. I, I like to know all that stuff. That way, if I am pushing that animal, I can sense that and I can back off a little bit and give it more space. Okay. Uh, so that that's my favorite way of photographing wildlife. My favorite approach to wildlife yeah. is just doing so in the most ethical way possible to make sure the wildlife is comfortable and that I'm comfortable yeah. because when you're photographing an animal that is not comfortable, to the everyday viewer, whoever's looking at that image, they won't be able to tell that that animal is uncomfortable. But to somebody who knows what to look for, you could put two photos side by side that look almost identical, but in one photo, you can tell that the animal is nervous, it's stressed out, and the other photo it's completely comfortable and you can tell really quick which one's which to the trained eye. And uh, I, I don't like those photos where you can tell that that animal is nervous or agitated, something like that. Oh, okay. I've never think about uh, this aspect. Uh, um, maybe it means to know very, very well the, the animal in question, yes. Um, uh, for example, uh, can you make an example of uh, of this sign uh, from animal when they are uh, in trouble, agitated, as you said? Yeah, for example, you know, you brought up photographing bears in Alaska earlier. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time photographing bears. And before I ever set out to photograph bears, I watched them from a long ways away to figure out what makes them nervous and what they do when they're nervous. For example, a bear, when it's feeling nervous, it'll lower its head and its ears will shift directions just a little bit. It'll okay. start breathing heavier and it'll make kind of like these popping noises with its jaw. And so if I see a picture of a bear and its ears are pinned back at a certain you know, direction and its head yeah. is a little bit lower than normal. Something is making that bear nervous. And I do have pictures of bears like that. And it's because there was, you know, it's a female that I'm photographing and a larger male comes up. And so she takes that posture okay. and I photograph it. But if I show a picture like that, I try to give the background of that picture to mm -hmm. let the viewer know, like, hey, this is what was making the bear nervous, even though she was completely comfortable with me, there was a large male, you know, off yeah. to my side that was making her nervous. But, you know, that's just one example. The same thing with uh, hoofed mammals like deer mm -hmm. or mountain sheep or whatever it is. A lot of it is in the ears. And sometimes, um, depending on like how dilated their eyes are, you can tell... Oh, okay as well. So there's just these little cues that you can pick up on to know if an animal is nervous or if it's comfortable. Okay, um, the, uh, moving hairs. 
I know myself because I've got uh, cats in, at home and they behave like that when they are quite neighbors. So they move the ears uh, back. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, so it's a um, common uh, behavior mm -hmm. in animals. So using uh, uh, ears and maybe the, the tail. Mm -hmm. The tail's a big one, especially again in like deer species um, mm -hmm. and it, a lot of other species as well. But the, the tail is a big indicator on whether the animal is about to run or if it's feeling nervous or uh, something yeah. like that. Mm, okay, okay. Oh, thanks for this uh, great info because uh, they are really precious uh, to, to know it and to understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever had to give up taking picture of a specific uh, subject for the reason we talk about? Uh... There's been a lot of times. I mean, I couldn't even count how many times I've walked away from a scenario that would have been amazing to photograph, but the animal was nervous and I didn't yeah. want to keep pushing it. Just the other day, for example, I was hiking up on the mountain um, and I ran into some bighorn sheep and most of the time these bighorns they're really comfortable with me photographing them but for some reason there was a female I was wanting oh, okay. to photograph she was on this really cool rock and I wanted to photograph her up there but as soon as I started my approach I could tell she didn't want me there at all and she was feeling nervous so even though there was this potentially amazing image that I could have made there, I decided to turn around and okay. go find something else because I could tell she didn't want me there. So th there's a lot of scenarios like that. I, I couldn't even count them, honestly. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's normal. I think it's normal. Uh, it happened uh, also to me uh, for with the beheaters. Uh, because I was actually I was too close uh, uh, the nest, so they was uh, they were scared by my presence. Even though I was inside a photo blind, but uh, this strange thing uh, in, in the middle of the field for for them was strange. So um, they uh, weren't uh, uh, they didn't go uh, in the. Um, inside the hole inside the the nest so i decided to to get back uh, and finally they they went in, into the nest uh, so nothing uh, in that case it's always better to to give up because mm -hmm. the, a picture uh, doesn't worth the the life of the animal so for only a picture and uh, and furthermore, I'm not a professional, so it, it doesn't make sense for me to to make a picture in condition like that. Yeah. No, I I agree, and I th I think there are too many professionals that would have stayed and not backed off because they're a professional mm -hmm. and they need their picture. But I, I think that's just the wrong mindset. And you did the right thing, in my opinion, by backing off and you spend enough time out there you can get that animal used to yourself and the blind and you can progressively move forward and get the original picture that you wanted yeah. it's just going to take a little bit more time but mm -hmm. i i agree with you and i think you did the right thing there yeah i think so yeah jimmy an extra question um you know i follow you uh, on instagram and where you publish amazing photos um, and I love uh, the photos about the great gray uh, owl. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, for me are fantastic. So uh, you know, I love raptors uh, and owls as well. Um, I watched the video uh, as well, but I was wondering how did you get the great gray owl by chance, or did you know um, where they lived? So. This kind of goes back to the question you asked earlier about how I prepare for trips or uh, how okay. much I plan trips. So I, I do a lot of trips 
where I explore new areas and I have a specific species in mind, you know, I'll do the research of, okay, this owl likes this type of habitat and this is its range that it lives in. I'll go explore this patch of forest because it seems, seems good. I, I do a lot of trips like that. And then once I find an owl in that area, if there are indeed owls there, I'll go back to that area year after year. So the recent great gray owl videos that I did just a few weeks ago, that's an area that I've explored a lot. I mean, I've, I've been back there just year after year. I, oh, okay. I visit a lot of different owl areas every year and that's one of them. So, you know, I'll pass through maybe half a dozen great gray owl spots each year and I'll do a video here, a video there. But um, yeah, that's one of the areas I've passed through almost every year for maybe like four or five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's just, it's a good area, but it does change from year to year. So I have to find where the owls are hanging out again and, and all that, but it, it is a very good area for great gray oh, owls. Yeah. That's nice because it's, uh, it's bigger than uh, normal owls. Owls. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in Italy, we got the maybe the great uh, uh, I don't know the English name. I think it's one of the biggest uh, owls. Uh, but where um, I live in Sardinia. We've got only the barn owls and the uh, little owls. Oh, maybe, uh, yes, there are the uh, scoops owls. So the tiny owls with the small uh, ears. Okay. I don't know if you, yeah. Uh, even though mm, they are super hard to, to get because they uh, stay camouflaged with the, mm, with the bark of the, of, of the tree. Mm -hmm. So you can't uh, see them uh, unless they make some noise or they fly uh, between branches, uh, but they are super nice. Uh, I've got them only once. But I hope next year to to got them again if I go in a specific place. <laughs> so That's okay, awesome. oh, uh, it's not by that. chance. Uh, it's not by ch no. Sorry, sorry, Jimmy. Uh, it's not by chance that you got the uh, that picture. Yeah, so I knew they were in that area, but I was going to say that's awesome that you've gotten them the once because owls are incredibly difficult to find mm -hmm. and photograph. And usually when you find them, there's, you know, every photographer in a hundred mile area knows about it there. So it's if you were to find an owl and have it by yourself, that's it's pretty amazing if you're able to do that. They're hard species to do that with. Yeah. Okay, actually, little owls over here are pretty easy to find because they make nests. Uh, okay, usually uh, little owls uh, should make nests uh, underground, making a mm -hmm. hole. Okay, but um, in my region, the uh, the ground, the terrain is quite hard, so they use uh, a big group of um, stones made by um, shepherd. Uh, to to clean uh, fields, so they if there is quite space uh, between the stones, they make a nest uh, in places like that. So it's quite easy because when you when I drive uh, around uh, my area, it's easy to to say uh, to see them on the top of the group of stones. So I <laughs> I always uh, uh, watch uh, outside. Maybe I'm driving. Uh, and my wife uh, says uh, says me to stay uh, aware, to stay careful when I'm driving because it's quite dangerous uh, <laughs> driving like that. But it's stronger uh, than me. I can't resist to watch around uh, when I'm driving. So uh, they are so funny, so so beautiful to to see. They are so small, like a ball. Uh, I don't know. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Jimmy. Uh, I don't want to um, to keep uh, you uh, forever. So <laughs> uh, I want to say uh, you uh, goodbye. Um, 
mostly I want to thank you for your passion to and to, uh, for your uh, for your reply for your answer. I think we are uh, super interesting as well as your channel. But I would like to uh, to have uh, for you more uh, subscriber, more user, because I think you deserve uh, more more views and more uh, more people watching you. Uh, your video as are so interesting um, and beautiful uh, but I seen that most people watch other kind of uh, of videos and I think it's uh, quite a pity uh, because your real uh, for me are fantastic so uh, at, the, at the end of this uh, interview when I am going to publish I'm going to make of course uh, your link to your channel and even for uh, Instagram, if you if you want, and so for me it's only a pleasure. Thank um, you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, if you want to add something before to say goodbye, uh, you are free to say um, everything. Maybe you want to promote your uh, uh, um, workshop. Uh, everything you want. Well, I no, I really appreciate the opportunity, and you know you thanked me for my patience. I'm the one who has to thank you for yours because you reached out to me quite a while ago and it's just been busy. So I appreciate your patience with me um, yeah. and my hectic schedule. But, uh, you know, you mentioned the workshops and I appreciate you letting me take a second to talk about those. Uh, but I do uh, my group bear photography workshops in Alaska each year and I've still got some spots available for those. So if you want to photograph Alaskan brown bears as they fish or the cubs play with each other as the bears wrestle around. Um, I've spent years out there getting to know those bears and just uh, the exact places where they fish and just the best places for photo opportunities. And I do it as uh, nicely and with the most luxury gear as possible. So um, yeah, I, I do those each summer and then I do private workshops as well. If there's a species you want to photograph that you haven't been able to, uh, I'll go out, find the animal, do the legwork, and then we'll set up a time to, to photograph whatever species you're looking for. So again, I, I appreciate the opportunity. This has been amazing to, to chat with you. And, it's been uh, a pleasure. Real. Of course, um, people uh, can find everything on your website. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I'm going to make uh, your website uh, also in the description below of, of the video. Uh, but I think I'm going to publish uh, in a couple of weeks, so not so late, I think. I, I hope so. Um, okay, Jimmy, thanks uh, again uh, for being here with me. It's been a real pleasure. And for all my uh, friends, uh, it's time to say goodbye. Uh, please uh, watch um, the Jimmy channel, uh, subscribe his channel, <laughs> and see you next time. So bye for now.